All right, Joel Gostin here from joelgostin.com. Keeping the New Jersey train rolling here on this channel. I wanted to bring on someone else from my home state who's got a, a great history in the uh, punk scene and various other scenes, uh, has been involved with a great label, has a great history behind the drums and otherwise. Uh, from, like I said, my home state, please welcome Mr. Lenny Splendorio. How you doing, man? Hey, Joe. How you doing? All right. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for being here. I guess we begrudgingly have to thank uh, Kaprowski for setting this up. Sure. You know, well, he's kind of become my um, unofficial artist liaison representative here. Listen, um, I'm, I'm proud of him right now, especially the whole morning noise thing is like, that's great. Oh, you know, yeah. I went to the, see them play with the Misfits at the arena and it was something to see him on that stage. So good yeah. for Mon Goofy, as we call him in our neck of the woods. <laughs> well, little does he know I'm talking to all you guys because we're forming a support group of people who know him. So we have a place to go to deal with it. Um, but yeah, I, I I missed that show, that Misfits show with Morning Noise on the bill. Um, unfortunately, because I'm up here in New England, I just couldn't get the pieces to fit. But, you know, right. doing great. I've got that new album coming out in a, in a few weeks on Cleopatra. Um, Sounds really good. I mean, so far the songs I heard sound really good. Yeah, it's great to see that band have a second life um, all these years later, um, you know, especially with their great front man they've got now. Um, and I, I bust Tommy's balls because he gives it right back to me. But, you know, truth oh, yeah, matter just... is, you know, um, those guys have been in it for a long time. And to see them, you know, at, at, at their age, being able to play an arena and put out an album, you know, God bless them. That's why. That's like, yeah. So my advice to Tommy was be I told Tommy, behave and don't fuck it up. That was my advice to him. You know, don't get kicked out of bands like yeah, you, you have other times. Well, we'll be talking about uh Tommy being kicked out of Bedlam in a bit, but um wanted to kind of go back to the very beginning because uh I'm looking forward to this because there's a lot of history there and a lot of my initial introduction to what was going on in New Jersey was via Buy Our Records, which is the label that you ran for several years. Uh, but going right. even before then, to the very beginning, um, when did music kind of become such a big thing for you, and, and particularly being a musician yourself? Oh, well, that question I always loved because my mom put a radio in my crib when I was a kid, so that's when music started for me. That and uh, my big sister, her record collection. So, and then it, it was it. I hit the floor running. Excellent. So when did you start playing drums? Oh, later on. I wish I did earlier, but um, I played later on. Basically, um, I always would mess around with the drums. And when Scott Frank from Bedlam wasn't showing up for band practice and everything, Jim was just like, just play. You can play drums. And uh, that was it. I was thrown into it for there officially. So I guess 80, 82 or 83. But before I did other little things with spinoff pro projects with the guys, the AOD guys and things like that. But Bedlam was my first official in the drum seat. Excellent. And I know um, I just had Paul Richard on a few days ago. Right. Um, I had Jack on and. Yeah, I have a Kaprowski uh, on too, but we don't yes, I watched all those. Um, you know, and you guys have been friends and often people who play music together for forty plus years at this point. How did your yeah, since nineteen eighty two, eighty three? You figure from there. And how did that friendship start for you? How did you get wrapped up with those characters? Well, I went to high school with Paul. We were. We didn't hang out in high school, but we went to the same high school in Union. And um, I remember seeing Paul at a, a Rainbow concert at the Capitol Theater. We, you know, we were both big fans of Richie Blackmore. And then we started talking a little bit. And right around, right when we graduated, I saw him at uh, the Triangle Liquor Store in Union. And uh, he gave me a tape. He says, this is a band I'm playing in now. It was the AOD demo tape. And 
you know, we were all getting into punk rock and everything around that time. And uh, then we took it from there. I went to see the band and Paul introduced me to Jack and Bruce and Dave and the rest of those guys. Excellent. So yeah. I, I know those guys, the original AOD lineup, um, were the ones who got buy our records going because the first aod ep was released on that label um sure and, paul paul and dave started up yeah and there was obviously a point where where you and jim the singer from bedlam kind of got very involved in buy our records how did your initial you know sort of entry into what became kind of your gig and jim's you know as the years went on yeah me jim and uh our friend chris Vieri, also from union that there was the three of us who ran the label but uh well jim when bedlam was around he wanted to put a record out and we just used that name and then jim uh jim and jim and chris financed the label so that was we just took it from there and i did a lot of the work the office work and whatever else and you know, I would I would imagine it's still the case today. I'm not as looped into Jersey as I used to be because I haven't lived there for for a lot of years at this point. But you know, there are indie labels. You know, there are guys in their garage putting out their own records and stamping some name on it and saying we're a label. Um, but by our records, as the '80s went on, really became a thing you know i remember when i had paul and i was trying to place it and i still can't place it but circa 87 when i was getting into a lot of like the metal magazines and and the public right. time i remember seeing an ad for buy our records you know where you had In rip magazine it was probably something like that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah. Well, we were trying. We had other bands when we were putting out, when we had the Skulls and our Raging Slab, it was definitely, we tried, you know, what we could do. I remember that being a very small and very expensive ad, for sure. <laughs> well, it left an impression on me because it was the first time I had heard of, you know, the majority of bands in that ad, you know, because I was at that point right. 10, 11 years old. And it was like perfect timing because even Rip Magazine at that point was kind of getting into like the crossover stuff. You know, it made yeah. sense to like read an article about the Crumb Suckers next to Motley Crue. You know, like it was that kind of era where everything was kind of melding. Yeah. Um, so I'm seeing your ad. I'm seeing Adrenaline OD's name and Raging Slab Ass Master was the album. Um Oh, wow, it's a label in New Jersey, too. You know, so that was kind of the light bulb in my head at the time. So let's start with a couple of the names I just mentioned, you know, because uh, obviously there was a time when you guys were bringing in bands, signing bands to the label. Um, how does someone like Raging Slab, uh, using them specifically, you know, get involved with Buy Our Records? Well, that's a friend, um, our uh, Lori, Lori S., who played bass for um, Children in Adult Jails and was a DJ on WFMU at the time, she introduced us to Raging Slab. She gave us a demo tape and we met, you know, so we had our friends, uh, I guess we would take recommendations and things like that. We had our little circle of that going on. But with um, Philadelphia uh, Flag of Democ Democracy, I guess AOD introduced us to those guys and then from them we ended up meeting up with uh electric love muffin so and of course there always, were always a friend recommending something well there were obviously great jersey bands on the label um i know you have pleased youth um the skulls uh you mentioned yeah. children in adult jail you know jails that's diane uh kamikaze old friend of both of ours um the oh, sure. x-men you know, um, and, and all those bands were kind of staples of Jersey in that time period. But I think the one record that maybe, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the one record that seemed to have the biggest impact actually came via New York. And that's the Pussy Galore record by our records put out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm real, I'm real proud of that record. That's that I, we got to put that record out. When I had their first single, 
um, feel good about your body. That came out. And then they put a 12 inch out and I contacted the number on the back of the record or something. And whoever I spoke to said, oh, they just, John just moved to New York. So you could call him at this number. So once he got settled in, I immediately called John up and uh, we talked from there. And uh, yeah, I'm still friends with John to this day. And uh, he made a great thing for himself. Uh, I'm a huge uh, Spencer fan all around. And anyway, he called me back and we got to do that one record because, you know, Homestead, Caroline, all those other labels were looking at him. And uh, I feel John went, did the record with us because I called them so immediately, like early, as soon as they came to New York, I was wanting to do that. Excellent. And so that Pussy was... Pussy Gold 5000. Yeah, I mean, Pussy Gold 5000, that's a, that's a coup to get that band at that time because um, that's when things were really starting to pick up for them. I think that's probably their best band lineup too with Neil... And that's that's my favorite i'm i'm friends with bob burt and i always joked to him about that's my favorite lineup and i always said that i would uh my spicoli moment would be if i won the lottery i would have like that lineup a pussy galore play a party for me so that's always been the running joke for years yeah with that but, uh, yeah i remember bob from uh the old maxwell's days you know man I, I gotta see if i can get him on here um, but what's great about that Pussy Galore record cover is you see them and they're all kind of like, you know, intense and very New York, right? You know? I have the poster. I have the, the poster hanging on my wall behind me. Right on. That's, you know, it's yeah, it's which I don't even have. I don't have any of my bio record stuff anymore. It went to like I have one of everything, and everything else is I don't know. I gave it away, and uh, but Tim who uh, lives up in uh, Sussex County. He has a lot of bio record stuff. He has a, he's a bio records aficionado or he, lunatic, whichever way you want to look at it. Lunatic from Northern New Jersey named Tim, not Tim Lassvogel. Yes. Right on. Tim has like, yep. Tim has like the bio records. And if I need something, like when there's a reissue, if I, I'll just, when he got everything, I said, if I need it, you got to just like lend it back to us. And he's always good for that. So, yeah, I, I have done a couple of bands with Tim, actually. So, yeah, you know, oh, OK, yeah, Tim's a, he's a wonderful guy. He is he's a wonderful guy. He is. Yeah. And I know a lot of stuff about music. You know, a lot of stuff about music. Tim he is frightening with how much he knows. I mean, it's just he knows what he likes and he knows what he don't like. He's got yes. two files. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Which is fine. I'm the same way, I guess. So it's good. But you know that that poster behind you, that record cover. You know when I when I saw that as a kid, I'm like, you know, uh, man, what a, what a gnarly, gnarly looking bunch of That's people. It. And we got them to play on. Oh, did you ever see the video when they were on Uncle Floyd? We had them on Uncle Floyd. I think I yeah. And Actually, Adrenaline OD, Bedlam, Flag of Democracy, Raging Slab, Pussy Galore. Um, and the Skulls had played on their own many times. Charlie was on there. But all, we were all on Uncle Floyd. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Talk, that, Floyd was a good sport. What's the deal with Floyd? Like, he's just not into letting people have any of that stuff? Is that... No, I don't, I don't think it's him. I think it was other people involved and a lot of stuff got lost and probably thrown out anyway. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> for years, if you put something on YouTube, it gets taken down, which I never understood that. It's like just, just promoting a, a great thing of the past. Yeah, it's... Not we had the bands on Floyd. Floyd had no problem saying Pussy Galore, but he wouldn't say Ass Master for, for Raging Slab for some reason. So I always thought that was funny. Speaking of Tim Lassful, next time you talk to Tim, ask him about the time he was on Uncle Floyd with his band, Martian Laxative. Which I'm, I'm surprised I've never heard about that. It was, I think it was a goof. I think it was done specifically for being on Floyd. Tim would know the details. And I, I'm almost certain it was Tim and Josh Silverman from Shirk Circus wearing goofy costumes playing these bizarre kind of like resonance type songs oh, uh, i have to ask him that martian laxative and if i get the details wrong i'm sure tim will tell me all about it in an email so yes 
<laughs> but yeah, so you know, Pussy War comes out, and I, you know, where I was going talking about the posters, you see them, and they they're all kind of like rough and intimidating. Then you meet Bob Burton; he's the nicest guy in the world, you know. So you know, yeah. but that was definitely a, a great record. Here's a here's a Jersey connection for you. I'm pretty sure I bought my copy of Pussy Gold 5000 off of Harry Bags from the old Earwax. From Earwax. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So it's all coming together. Um, That's cool. Am I correct that Bio Records got to the point where you actually had a European version of the label going? Yeah, out? there was this, this label um, called Semaphore Records. Um, and the gentleman's name was Rory. Good guy. I don't know. I didn't handle a lot of that. That was Chris. And we had another friend, Dominic Aaron, um, who I think negotiated that deal. But they put out, let me I have to think a minute. I know we did the Honeymoon Killers, Flag of Democracy. I know those two. And Adrenaline OD. No, but no, adrenaline OD was the rough trade. I can't, I can't think of what how many came out in Semaphore. Just maybe two or three releases. And they put CDs out and vinyl. Hmm. Excellent. So, uh, was the label at 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 any point where, you know, was it was it was it basically a job for you guys? Was it your 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 day job when By Our Records was really. At its peak. No, well, for a while, like I said, Jim and Chris financed the label, and I did all the uh, office work. And for a while, I I quit my day job at the record store, and I was doing that, and I was drawing a small salary. But it was basically the money just going back in to put more records out or repress records. We did um, eighteen different artists and thirty releases. I think that's what we did total. So, but money always just went back in and then like the well went dry and it, that was it. We spread ourselves, I don't know, I always feel personally we spread ourselves thin with, we started as the punk label and we stood true to it, but we branched out a little bit to Pussy Galore and Honeymoon Killers and Big Stick and then Raging Slab and the Skulls and X-Men and PMS, which was more on the metal side. And then our last release, uh, was this band called Lucky Seven, which was like a, a Cajun Zydeco band out of New York with had um, people who played with the Rock Cats and it was, they were really good. And that was through an Enigma release when we signed a deal with the label where they uh, did a co-release and, uh, that, and that was it. But that was definitely different from when AOD put out Let's Barbecue. So we might have took a wrong turn there where people who just like punk stuff gave up on the label and other people didn't give the label a chance because they thought we were just a punk label and we had other stuff as well. But that's the way I always felt about it myself. And then you need a lot of money to keep throwing down with, at that time. CDs were just getting bigger and we had to start manufacturing them. So this would have been around 1990 things kind of ground to a yeah 90 it pretty much went went up yeah we had like a court we've had a corporation involved and we had to even go as far as to get it all dissolved and it was sad because if i had money i would do it tomorrow i i love it if i find a band that i like i would uh put out their record in a heartbeat it's harder for bands now Bands going on tour, it's it's hard. Gas money and oh yeah, things like that. A lot of bands I talk to, um, I'm friends with Ryder and Blaine from Nashville Pussy, and they they're going to Europe this summer because they could go there and have a successful tour. Where in America, it's driving to the gigs and it's financially hurting the bands, which sucks. Yeah, totally. I was talking to a guy not too long ago who who plays decent venues, you know. He ain't playing arenas, but he's playing like, you know, three to five hundred clubs, you know, capacity clubs. Right. And it's costing him fifteen hundred bucks a day to keep his bus on the road. 
you see, think about it, that's a lot. And then like the people, your crew and everyone's got to eat and sleep somewhere. It's, it's sad because I love live music. That's my thing. I still, I want to go to the club and see some bands play and it's harder for the bands to do that. Well, I, that's obviously why bands do the whole VIP meet and greet deal, you know? Exactly. You know, it makes, yeah, it to makes total sense. When the Stranglers were out here years ago, I think it had to have been 2013. Uh, I think it was their, their first tour of the States in forever. And uh, sadly, Dave, Dave Greenfield's last tour of the States. And they were doing like a hundred dollar meet and greet then, you know, yeah. but, but that was a cool package. Uh, this is before I did started my website and stuff, you know, picked up the writing thing again. And I figured, fuck, for a hundred bucks, I'll do it. I'll support the band. You know, they're out here. Yeah, if you're a fan, you want to do it, that's great. And plus they're selling more merch. You go to a show now, you can buy their albums, and it's right. which is good. I like to support the bands when I go out to do that. Yeah, absolutely. It's not just like the memento you take home, like the t-shirt with the dates on the back. You're you're buying gas for your band that you enjoy. Yeah. You know? And I always tell I'm a, people, I'm a fan of uh the band Twin Temple, I'm a fan of them and I've seen them recently. And they do this great meet and greet where you get to meet the band, they'll take a Polaroid, they'll give you a, a sign uh, set list, they'll make a cross on your forehead, forehead with blood and bless you, the whole blah, blah, blah. But I think it's so cool. You know, it's really, really good. Yeah, you and got it helps the band stay on the road. And I always tell people, you know, if, if you're lucky enough to be in a position where bands and publicists will ask hey do you want to review the show we'll put you on the guest list yeah of course but you better grab be better buy a t-shirt on the way out you better buy a cd or something on yeah. the way out because if they're letting you in for free you gotta oh, especially sure you know um but yeah that's that's kind of how it is right now it's it's more about you've got to do more than just go to the show you've got to get everything you know yeah. um but with buy our records, I'm kind of curious. Well, first of all, what what was the most successful release on the label? Was it Pussy Core? No, no. Well, Adrenaline OD, Wacky Hijinks album. If I think that we sold on vinyl ten thousand, or we pressed up ten thousand copies of that. Wow. When it all said and done, plus we did cassettes on that, so that's definitely our our biggest seller. Pussy Gold 5,000, we did 5,000. We, we pressed 3,000 first, and then uh, I asked John, can we just, you know, it sold out quick, and I knew that was our only record we were getting from him, so he agreed that we did another 2,000, so we made 5,000 of those. Cool. Um, yeah, the AODs for sure. Now, what what were the releases that you're... you're uh happiest with and that you you really thought the label did a great job and you love the music and were really just thrilled to have him part of that that stable of bands and albums at the time um, well definitely i like the aod records a lot all of them and the pussy galore record the big stick record the raging slab and the, and the skulls records i think they're really really good records for sure we put a lot into it. We always tried to make sure the cover looked good because I always felt more people see your record than ever hear it. So we always tried to have a nice package on the cover. And you always got stuff inside, a poster and a sticker. It's, uh, hey, I grew up as a Kiss fan and all that. And you opened up the records and all this cool shit fell out. So we always wanted to do that. Totally, totally. So yeah. before we kind of dive more into the 90s stuff, um, I want to go back to the 80s, but talk about what you were doing musically, which um, I know obviously included time spent in Bedlam. Um, I can't believe you were in a band with Kaprowski and lasted as long as you did, because I can. Yeah, only Tommy was always good. I mean, Tommy would get drunk and fall asleep, but most of the time he was, uh, he was good. He just... But when you get too drunk, sometimes it was a little crazy. Yeah, the last bit, I was in the last wave of Bedlam. Those songs on the reissue would have been our next record that I would have played drums on. Those were all like live or demo versions of most of the songs we had. And they're, they're really great songs. I'm glad that they got to come out through Beer City. 
the first Beer City, Beer City wasn't crazy about putting it on there. But when I sent them the tape and they listened to it, they were like, they wanted, they were happy to do it. Cool. I, I'm, I'm looking around. I think I've got that record within reach. Uh, actually, I don't think I do. But um, there's a vinyl reissue of uh, a, a ton of Bedlam music called Final Bedlam. Um, it's uh, with with one or two exceptions, perhaps it's pretty much everything the band recorded um, during its run in the. Um, now, there's some songs that are not on there. Um, I think for time, we got most of Total Bedlam and most of Lost in Space. I think, but then there was two covers that we did that they didn't put on. We did the the theme from Repo Man, the movie, the Iggy Pop song, which is really good, and. Uh, Afwita saying, which uh, our friend Steve saying, I heard you talking. Uh, it warmed my heart the nice things you said about Steve Garlic Rhino um, on Kaprowski's podcast because he's he's my best buddy and I miss him dearly. And his birthday's this Friday, so uh, yeah. Hold, hold on one second till I got this over here. I gotta grab this in my room. This one is. I have this picture. It's like sitting here next to like, you know, next to my bed with other photos of my family and stuff. But me and Steve, uh, he was like a brother to me. I miss him. And uh, he was my concert buddy. So. Yeah. It's... But yeah, and uh, it made me feel good. You said nice things about him, how you, you met him through Facebook. And uh, yeah, he made a lot of friends on the, uh, are you a member of the Rockers to Life? Are you, are you? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So Steve made a ton of friends through there that people he never met just from his, like, he was a great storyteller and he would always like, you know, talk about gigs and stuff and great guy. Yeah. You know, for, for all the things I hate about social media, um, you know, that's a great example of why, why it's, Still good to be on it, you know, because you, you cross paths. Oh, yeah, there's there's people whose posts you love to see every day, and yeah, you know, you know. Sure. and and I know obviously he was part of Bedlam. Um, I missed the show that Tommy put together a few years back, the final, final show. Um, oh, yeah, at the court tavern, yeah, 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 I would have loved to have seen that, but I was, I was up here in New England doing family stuff at the time, so I yeah. Missed so um yeah rhino and i never met face to face you know but i still i still see him almost every day pop up in my memories with something you know no, that's good that's yeah. good yeah definitely um so and we should mention the final bedlam is worth getting simply for the fact you fire tommy on the last track which is uh, well we were just recording rehearsals because some of those songs were new and that's what what's great about it is the way America has been obsessed with reality TV and all this horse shit over the past bunch of years. I mean, that's the real deal. When that happened, I didn't listen to that tape for two or three weeks because I knew what was on it and I didn't want to hear it because it was scary. But you listen, you hear them playing and that's a song that we're doing is uh, was originally a song by uh, my friend Chris Vieri's band, his our first band called Black Sambo at the time. And, uh, it was called The Ghost of Cheryl Ott, and we redid it. Bedlam's song was called Death by Lethal Injection. I just put new lyrics to it. But that song, it's like a slow, dirgy thing, and you hear Tommy missing strings and banging into the amp, and you hear that re reverb noise that it makes, and it goes over, and that's just Jim in his finest hour. <laughs> like, you know, that's it. My favorite line is, if anything's broke, he's paying for it. That's my favorite line that Jim says. And it had to be on the record because it yes. just made so much sense. That's when Tommy asked him, like, it's, come on, it's perfect. It's just like, come on, he was kicked out of mental decay. Sucks twice, he says. But he better be a good Kaprowski. Don't, you're in a big band now. Behave yourself. Yeah, don't fuck it up, Tommy. Don't fuck it up. Steve Zing will keep him, Steve Zing will keep him in line. Yeah. That's good. That's I was going to say, I know you're a drummer, Tommy. You, you, you can only get away with so much in that band. <laughs> Steve's, got, Steve's got a good teacher, so he knows. It's like the trickle-down effect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Um, so 
was sand in the face the next band you were part of after bedlam yeah right after bedlam uh i was always friends with paul and michelle and uh they they asked me um oh do you want to do this and i was like oh yeah absolutely because bedlam had just broke up and i was sad about that and yeah i was right into that cool and how long did that, that was a lot last of so i know there's a, and I'll definitely put a link up in the video description. You have a, a band cam page where you have some music from various bands you've been in. Yeah, bands that I played in. I just start up a little page. Um, I think maybe less than two years or close to it with Paul and Michelle. It was a lot of fun. We played a bunch of shows. And uh, they always got a bad rap for things at the end with their like, I don't know, people talking about things that Paul was into, but I just had a good time playing with them. I never saw anything like that, like lyrical content or whatever. But who knows? Was it, was it Peter Aaron? He was part of that, wasn't he? Um, Peter, that, Peter was in the, the very first lineup of Sand in the Face. I never even saw that lineup because I think after that he moved to, I think, Cincinnati area after that and yeah I think so but then there was the lineup that made the album which is a great record that Sand in the Face record their drummer on that record his name was Gus what, what a great drummer he had like a jazz influence he was really really good I was just honored that Paul and Michelle wanted me to join and uh we you know I just learned their songs and we did it that's why I put it on Bandcamp because we never got to release that and it's a Pretty good recording. There's mm. a live at CB's and a five or six songs we did in the studio. Yeah, the, the CB's recording is really cool. I was listening to that today, actually. Yeah, really good quality. You know, it's kind of interesting because that was late 80s. And, you know, as we're talking, I'm thinking by our records it was kind of ahead of its time in a way, because when I first started reading about bands and seeing who was out there it was that late 80s where everything was kind of melding into these really eclectic sounds you know you had like circus of power warrior soul you know so all those bands all the time they were great yeah and it yeah. seems that by our records was kind of there early on because you have you have pussy galore and aod you know and and these different bands kind of you know different well, styles as the time went on, I didn't like the next wave of hardcore. It just wasn't for me. I didn't like any of that. So I got more into those long air bands, droney things, and the early sub pop stuff like Soundgarden and Mudhoney and Tad. I was all about that shit around the clock. I just love the heavy riffs that they would lay down. We're, we're, we're still in the 80s um, in this conversation. Right. So the kind of... Um, put a put a cap on that part of it um we really should talk about wfmu and specifically pat duncan um you know when i have someone on from the 80s on the channel we talk about jersey inevitably pat comes up um and i know bedlam um the the compilation you guys put out you know not too long ago has songs recorded on pat's show so i know he was you know, obviously in the mix with so many bands in the beginning. What are your memories of FMU? And that, that's the first, those songs I think were recorded when SOU was in the Uppsala, the little, the basement house in East Orange before they moved to the second location, which we I went there too. It was always fun. We, were, we would always go in and set up and play for Pat. It was always, always a good time. Usually quiet when we were in there and we kept to ourselves and didn't cause any trouble. And, you know, even Kaprowski was good. Well, he worked there. So Tommy knows. Yeah. 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 I, I didn't get to play there. I wasn't old enough to play FMU until um, it was in the house. Remember FMU was in a house and like you would play in the living room. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 So for me, it was like 95. I was 17 when I played FMU for the first time on Pat's show. And I went back there like seven times. As a matter of fact, we'll 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 skip around because I actually played a show on Pat's show under the name The Parasites with 
a couple guys that you played with, Ronnie and Anthony, as the accelerator. Right, right. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll go there and we'll come back. But I I know you, you, you know, we're playing with those guys for a while. And obviously, Ronnie, especially, has been around. You know, the accelerators were putting out stuff on Mother Records back in 84 or whatever it was. Yeah, I think, uh, 80, yeah, maybe even earlier, maybe 83. I'm not sure. I have the record. Yeah, so yeah, I still play with them. I haven't played in a year, but I think I'm going to play a show with them in July. So yeah, it seems to me. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, because I kind of I, I see things that Anthony posts, especially, and it kind of seems like there's a revolving door of uh, of people beyond Ronnie and, and Anthony. Is that? Well, there's a, a lot of different drummers since I've been in the, I've been playing with them for maybe seven or eight years, but there's other drummers that are always, you know, revolving in and out. Mm -hmm. And then they, all, they also do uh, uh, this band called Take It Dee Dee, which is uh, my friend Bill, who was in originally in, um, oh God, why am I drawing a blank? He's singing. He was in Fetal Rage as a drummer. Okay. And, and he was also in the Blisters. But he sings now, and they do a bunch of remote songs. And it's really good. Yeah, I'm sure Ronnie's in heaven playing playing that stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, excellent. He excellent. does it well. That's another name that comes up um, now and now and again. Great band, the Blisters. You know, they, yeah, they were a good good band for sure. Yeah, yeah, and that early '90s era was kind of great too. You had Shirk Circus, the Blisters. Um, who was that band down in New Brunswick? Um, Buzzkill, yeah, you know, um, a little bit later, yeah. Shade Heart was another one that was around at the time. Um, but the early 90s was when you, um, and Jim and and Rhino, uh, did Hearse, so yeah, and uh, that was I a lot of fun. We had, um a keyboard player, which made it, it was a different sound for sure. Adapted to our own style. Yeah. And I there's have, a movie. Did you ever see the, did you ever see the movie Hot Rod Hearst movie? I've heard about it. I have heard about, I've heard the you legend see, of it. I haven't yeah. seen it. That's um, our buyer records. The other partner, Chris Fieri, he has a company, Ghostland Films. And that's, he's made a lot of films and that's one he did with us. Hopefully I could put a record out with her stuff someday and have like the film included. I would love to do something like that if I found someone who wanted to put it out. Yeah, that'd be cool. I remember Jim from the mid nineties pipeline days. Um, I, memories are hazy. Shocker. Um, but Especially I, where he's around. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, yeah. I remember Jim um, Silverman and uh, Dan Brewer from head wound. Um, right, and the pipeline. <laughs> oh, sure, always in the back. We always had a party in the back. Yeah, Jim is a man of few words, so there's not, you know, you get a hello out of him, you're lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there were there were a few interesting nights, and I'd have to drive home afterwards, and that was even more enjoyable. But anyway, well, it, yeah. Where did you live back then? I was up in northern New Jersey, like in Sussex County, um, by Sparta. Oh, so you got a little ride from the pipeline. You got a 40 minute ride to get up there. Yeah, a little bit of a ride. <coughs> and I would go to the pipeline connections. Yeah. Then I went to school in Montclair and I was going to uh Maxwell's a lot, CB's quite often. You know, I started I started playing at CB's in 90, 96 or 97. Started playing the pipeline earlier than that. What what was your main band that you were in? At that time, it was a band on Headache uh, called Squiggy. Oh, okay, no, I, yeah, sure, I remember. Yeah, and I also played in Broken Heroes around that time. Um, so it was kind Broken of Broken Heroes are still playing. Yep. Yeah, and Andy it plays with them now, right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Broken Heroes. Um, I just um, had Pete on the guitar player. He's one of my best friends, and they're actually playing Sunday at Dingbats um with uh dead blow hammer which is rob kabula from an af and okay sure 
yeah so it's you know a lot of these people are still around doing stuff which is great you know and yeah um, one of the reasons why I started doing this show is because, you know, we had a couple people within the Broken Heroes family pass away um, in the last few months. And I'm like, you know, you reach a certain age, man, you got to look back and, and bring on well, believe me, talk tell, about the time. Tell me about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's what's happening these days. We get older and that's normal part of life, I guess. Yeah. So I do remember Hearst um, around in those days. Um and definitely a different vibe from Bedlam, like I said. Um, and hers was it two? Am I correct? Was it two seven inches with hers? Yeah, or more. Yeah. yeah, no, we did too. We have a few other songs recorded. I would love to put put an EP out. All those songs are on on Bandcamp. You can hear them now. Yeah, did it's a did, lot of fun. Was that the last thing Jim did band wise? Yeah. 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 That's that's a bit of a shame. It'd be cool because he was such an interesting front man, you know. It's yeah. Bedlam just did it. We didn't have any. The only one who had it real kind of training was Kaprowski when he came to the band. But Bedlam was like, okay, you let's just do this. Frank learned bass. Scott played drums. I guess he had you know had a kit, but and uh, Steve played guitar and everyone learned and did it. And Jim would be like uh, we'd write the lyrics down and I'd sing it like this kind of jam and I'd lay it out for him. And, uh, it was a lot of fun. And it's nice that all these years later, people want to talk about it. So that's why it's, you know, I'm happy to be here and do this. Yeah, definitely. As I told Tommy, you know, Bedlam, kind of a big band for me, you know, as I was trying to, you know, find out the history of where I'm from in New Jersey, you know? Right. And getting that first record, you know, it's one of the best hardcore records. I, I actually believe there's a Yahoo list somewhere. Yahoo did like the best hardcore albums of all time. And they put that first bedroom album on the list. Yeah. I'm I'm friends with Rob O'Connor, who who did that, made that list. And yeah, it's funny. Yeah, it's, you know, I'm glad, you know, it's it's not for everybody. It's it's loose, it's loud, it's raw. What pressing do you have? Do you have a, an original pressing that, like, not a real record cover? It's like a big seven inch that just folds up, or do you have a cover on that? I've got a cover on Yeah, it's the second pressing. We even remastered it, so it sounds a little bit better. Something's make, got changed around. Make sure Buddy Fucker is nice and crisp on that turntable. <laughs> I, li I like those droney songs. That's why, like, I want to. I want to be in a band now, and I want to play like Flipper and Public Image and Birthday Party. So if, if anyone wants to have a band like that and is looking for a drummer, please reach out to me. That's what I want to do, some slow, muddy shit now. That's what I want to play. Yeah, yeah. Flipper, one, one of the greatest live bands ever, ever, Great. ever. I've never yeah. seen a band bum out more people faster than Flipper. It's amazing. No, I love it. <laughs> I saw them back in the day when they first came around. Ooh, that was just a lot of fun. <clears throat> saw them at City Gardens, the Mud Club. <laughs> it's great. Did you see them when they came around a few years back with Yao singing from Scratch Ass? Yes, I did. I did. I did go to that. It was only, um, well, it was Ted Falcone and the drummer Steve. So those two guys, but but Steve Yao, he was great because I saw Scratch Acid back in the day, and I always loved that. He's intense. Yeah, it was a good show. Yeah, gotta be careful watching the Yao show. You might end up with balls in the face if you're not careful. <laughs> I saw yeah. some young people in Boston learn that lesson once with him, but. <laughs> um, so I, I fast forwarding a little bit, I remember. And I actually didn't know you were a member of this band until recently, but I remember this is a bit further in now we're talking maybe early 2000s, late 90s. There was a buzz about this band that some people were saying were, were kind of like a Gigi Allen um, or to compare it to a Jersey band, kind of like a genocide vibe going on and yep. outrageous and crazy and filthy and awesome. And that's the band George is Dead. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I know I, I I recently learned you were the drummer in that band. Yeah, yeah. I, 
I, yeah, um, there was a drummer or two before me, but I, I'm on the records that we did. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was, uh, we were like a real, real deal for sure. George is a sweetheart, one of my best friends. And uh, but yeah, we would come out and he would cut himself and burn things on stage. <laughs> Nothing, this would not fly today at all. I'm surprised it did then. But uh, yeah, it's a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And that band too recorded on WFMU. And uh, yes, I love the recording you got on that. Yeah. It's band. great because there's so many, Diane did a good, just so many swear words where we did, she just did flip flops on them all. And, you know, it's like, God, one of the songs called Fuck Me. So it's just like, that's the whole thing. But yeah, we played on there. Yeah. Uh, that that must have been interesting being so we got to play great. Maxwell's with um nine nine nine. We played at uh the Birch Hill with Dead Kennedys, of course not with Jello singing, but that was the biggest show we ever played. And George came out wearing uh just a pre-shirt with no pants and no underwear. <laughs> and uh I know there was a lot of like parents there with their kids that they weren't happy about that. And the two guitar players, uh guitar and bass were dressed like altar boys. Mm. It was crazy, yeah. It was a good time. It was a good set. The Birch. Yeah, yeah, we played some good shows for sure with George's Dead, considering. We played with, uh, who's the, the slave girl in um, Guar? She uh, has her own band. Is it Slavestra Hyman? Is yeah, that... so, so and we opened for them at The Saint, and uh, she has all this fake blood and all this crazy stuff. And George cut himself and bled all over. And she was so pissed off. She was yelling at us like a mom. We're like, are you kidding me? Uh, so we made our, our little mark over here. Yeah. George was really into um, the Confederacy of scum bands back then, you know, down south. Oh, yeah. yeah Anti-scene yeah. and Cox Bar and all that. And he really wanted to be part of that. And that's what we were kind of modeled after. And it's funny you said Gigi... We did a GG genocide song that we uh, mixed together like a mashup. It was uh, Die Wasted and, uh, oh God, uh, it'll come to me, the GG song that we did, but it's like a mashup of them. Highest Power. <laughs> Highest Power and Die Wasted. Yeah, there, there may be a genocide thing coming to this channel. Uh, I can't confirm nor deny at this point, but. Ah, maybe Mr. Powers? Possibly, possibly. Yeah. We'll have to see, but in inquiries have been made. I'll put it that way. Um, but yeah, I remember I remember when that band was around and hearing like this band's really fucked up. And I'm like, good. <laughs> there, there needs yeah. to be more of that right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I even put up, I sent you the links. There's a Facebook page with some pictures of George is dead and So yeah, that was after Hearst. So George is dead. That was kind of like early 2000s, right? So uh, was, Devil yeah. House, was Devil House the next band? Devil House came later. Charlie Pip, who, you know, Charlie Pip's played with his own bands and the Colors and Johansson. He's a, a great talent. He called me up and I played with him and his wife. And we had Devil House for about two years. That was great. It was a lot of fun. We did a CD and we played a lot of shows. I really worked hard on that. That's some of the drumming that I'm proud of the most is uh, me being in that band. I remember Charlie Pip in the 90s, like mid 90s, he used to do sound at the Cove. Remember the Cove? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, he was a sound guy there because I, I played there a ton of times with different bands. and That was Hearst's first show out in front of people was uh, after Pat Duncan, it was The Cove. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah with uh, Jane Jubilee. The Jane program. Jubilee, she's great. Yeah, yeah. Great girl. I haven't seen her in years, but I love her. Yeah, but whenever you bring up her name, if somebody knows her, everyone's like, oh, yeah, Jane was great. Yeah, we had a good time. The Cove and Roselle. Yeah, it was a cool spot. That was, if I remember, that was an all ages place, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And she she brought some decent bands. She used to bring that band from New York down, uh, Crisis. 
Remember Christ? Oh yeah, yeah, with the girl singer. Yeah, they yeah, were cool. Karen. Yeah, they were really cool. They did Karen real Christ, well. Yeah. yeah, Broken Heroes played there once. I think like the electric got all fucked up because you know a bunch of crazy skinheads. <laughs> but, yeah, it was it was a good spot for sure. Um, you've mentioned record stores a couple uh, a couple of times in this conversation. Uh, we should mention that you are involved with one now with another sure i work uh, yeah yeah i work at uh randy ellis's um store the man cave in heights town you know randy book city gardens for years and he's had a record store for over 10 years he was in bordentown first that's good we have a lot of uh all old vintage stuff cassettes 45 cds we try and sell it all randy loves all the kitschy stuff and we have um books and all types of stuff in there record store day is this weekend which is you know a lot of new releases or different special releases are coming out so yeah that's uh if you're in that area you should come by and check out the store or support your local records record stores for sure everybody you yeah. gotta buy physical music i don't just stream i listen to stuff i'll stream stuff in the car but if i love something i'm, I'm getting it, a physical copy of it it's that's important yeah. And, you know, what people don't realize, um, most people, I don't think, realize how shitty the royalty rates are for streams. Um, it's I'm true. Sure you're getting nothing, nothing for streaming. You know, I get my Spotify royalties and I'm like, maybe I can buy a sandwich with it. You know, it's like no, it's, it's like nothing. And, and bands even with million plays are getting nothing. So it's not it's not good. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking pennies. People, sometimes. Yeah. people laughed and pointed their finger at Metallica years ago for complaining about Napster, but it was like it's true. It's you know, yeah. People don't want to respect music. They'll go out and they'll spend all this money on an expensive meal or other shit, but music they don't want to pay for. And bands are putting their like blood, sweat, and tears into it. It's not fair. Um, a cup of burnt coffee at Starbucks costs uh, basically what a fucking cd or an ep uh, would yeah. go to a show i hate i love coffee and i hate that place i don't think it tastes good at all i'd rather go anywhere else dungan donuts all the way man at least for me yeah gotta get the real stuff um well that's cool i'm glad randy's still doing it you know i i i didn't work do any work with randy when he had city gardens but yeah because he was done by i think early 90s he was done at 91 or 92 anyway yeah i did. Where it might have been open but yeah i mean i saw i went to city gardens it was a little bit later than that it was the luna chicks and bad religion okay so that, that was probably still him if that was going on yeah and mm. it, that place was like the thunderdome it was fantastic um you know and, and i got to work with randy a little bit because for a nanosecond about 15, 16 years ago, I played drums in The Fiends. Um, oh, okay. And he was booking someplace in Trenton at the time. I No, it wasn't. It was a, it was a smaller place. No, it was it was a different record. So it was the record collector also in Bordentown. It could have been that where he was booking bands. Yeah, I got a flyer somewhere, but I can't remember. It was a while ago, but Randy put on that show. Yeah. And, uh, he's a trip. He's a trip, you know. He's still doing shows. We're doing uh, Tommy Stinson is playing in the store on Saturday night after Record Store Day. We move all the like uh, the racks out of the way, and you could fit about 50, 60 people in there for a show. It's then we put it all back. That's so, cool. Yeah, it's it's so important um, to support brick and mortar. Um, there's a great one in in Massachusetts, Bridge Nine which was a label, then it became a store and a venue. Um, you know, and they've had some great shows there. Yeah, in the back, the, like the storage area, they turn into yeah. a venue. Right. And it's so cool. It's like walking into 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Well, did you ever go to Vintage Vinyl when they were open? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you bet. I, I managed that store for 10 years. Really? That's that's when I was playing with George from George's Dead because he worked there too. So that's right. Yes. Yeah. That time I worked there, I was the store manager. 
Yeah, I, I was there quite a few times. I was at the Aussie signing. Were you? Wow, that was great. That was really exciting. Ozzy, I wasn't like, I'm a huge fan. And it didn't hit me until he was there. And he's like in the store and he comes up to me. He goes, where's the bathroom? I'm like, right this way, Ozzy. <laughs> That's it. But I got like, he wasn't doing autographs. He was just doing pictures. But I got an autograph CD from my son. Yeah, he, it was, he, I was a hoot. To see. We did shit. Rob Zombie and Danzig and Slayer and all types of bands. It was, it was a, lot, a lot of fun. Yeah, that Ozzy thing was so much fun. I remember... It was like in late October, early November, or something like that. And I, at that time, didn't want to like have a winter coat on. And I used to cut the sleeves off my shirts to show the tattoos, you know. Yeah. And I'm freezing my balls off because uh, we're all in line, you know. So I walk in, I got, you know, the, the bumps like this high, like my arms are like popsicles. So I, I go up to meet Oz, you know, I do the handshake thing. And I somehow, like, kind of graze him. He's like, oh, he's a Christ Rosen fucking freezing man. <laughs> That's, That's what I remember. Funny. And I got a picture of him looking at my, he, a picture of him looking at my Misfits tattoo. Um, <laughs> before he yells at me for having cold arms. I'm like, well, Ozzy told me my arms were cold. That's my memory of Ozzy. But that was at Vintage Vinyl. Yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah, so I was, you know, I did many years at different record stores. It was Al Wilk Records up North Jersey in the malls and everything, and then Vintage Vinyl. And you know. That's great. Well, I, I wish Randy well with it. You know, I hope he has a great day. I'm sure he's going to have a Yeah, fun. I hope so, too, because business is tough. It's, it's hard to, like, you know, keep the doors open and keep buying new products. So that's what's tough. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing he got through the pandemic, um, you know, and is still active in 2024 with it. You know, I mean, it's yeah. a place like that, the people, people who know the importance of it will hopefully keep it going. You know, the the clientele. You know, yeah. Appreciate the culture behind record stores, good record stores. Um so we're talking about what's coming up in a few days. You know, it's April at this point. Um, what's the rest of your 2024 look like musically and otherwise? Anything in the works you want to share? No, I just, I like going to see live music when bands come to town. I'll try and always go with my buddy Brian to see a show and play another show with the Accelerators. I like to get a, a start playing with some other new people I, I live in trenton now so i don't i'm not up north anymore where they live and I like to find some other guys to jam with and well i still have the energy to do it so i'm a middle school teacher i'm tired as hell when i get home yeah so uh <laughs> I just let's just say we'll just put it at that yeah i oh, i yeah. understand that i i did a stint um doing social work up here um uh, with, with young 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 folks and uh yeah yeah five and six don't come fast enough sometimes but it's rewarding work it just kicks your ass you know no yeah it's it's you know i'm getting older so it's it <laughs> but i love my music and I'm, I'm psyched that aod's coming around i'll be going to see them at the dingbat show at the end of may and i'm real proud of those guys and especially dave with writing his book and you know possibly a screenplay coming out of this and it's exciting and crazy it's something that i was like part of the 1985 tour that i did with those guys three months across the country is will always uh hold the place in my heart for sure you know it was the best six guys in a van seeing aod every night play their songs they were lightning fast on that mm -hmm. tour it was crazy 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 yeah, and they I'm, still do it. We'll come yeah. out and see them in May. Yeah, it's a, it's it's and, a, and, and, uh, and morning noises on a big festival in California, and they're going to Vegas to play. So, look at that. Jersey punk rock seems to be uh, alive and kicking in twenty twenty four. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I like to see some newer <laughs> bands doing it. You know, um, it's cool. Oh, I. There's been, I go to see my uh, my favorite new local, newer local Jersey band is the OC Rippers. 
they're like they're a great band. Then and Fear Gods, of course, Jersey Wise. But I'm always going to see. Uh, I love Scumbag Millionaire, who are from Sweden, I believe, and Otoki Beaver, who are from Japan, who are like mm-hmm. remind me of the, remind me of the Bad Brains at times, and yeah. Die Spitz and Amel and the Sniffers. I still and Bobby Lee's. I saw this band a few weeks ago, uh, Les Lullies from France, who are amazing, great punk rock two guitars and a bass and they like they're all singing together in unison it's good you should check them out for sure yeah i definitely will definitely will so that's it i'm a rocker for life until that's it you know right on man well well thank you for putting out all the great music with the label uh back in the day like i said that that time period was a major gateway for me i wouldn't be doing the stuff i'm doing now without those early introductions um you know i i grew up as a young kid in jersey kind of idolizing the first wave of bands and musicians Koprowski included i hate to admit um yeah come on tommy's like he's got that downstroke tommy is like you know he used to break strings i'm like do you have another guitar don't break a string when you're wasting on cbgb stage he he's he's i had steve zing on uh a few months back and I, I, I said to Steve, you know, Kaprosky, you know, he's up there with Giant Ramon and, and Steve Jones, in my opinion. I mean, I remember I, 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 I called when I was a kid, I was like 19. I called up Steve and talked him into having Morning Noise play at American Legion Hall. I was booking shows at the time. And those guys hadn't played him forever. But, you know, it was it was Kaprosky, Steve, Chris and Mike, the old singer. Right. And, uh, and that's where that's where I met Jack Steeples because Jack came up I think with Paul actually, um, but they they started with that song um, "Death in a White Cloud," I think right? And you know, da, 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 da. and I was uh, the the guys in the Squiggy looked at me and they're like, "Holy shit!" Just watching Tommy like, "Holy shit! Look at this guy play!" Yeah, it's a real deal. <laughs> uh, drives us crazy uh, we'll say here we'll say happy birthday to rhino too it was birthday's friday there he is happy yes. birthday steve Definitely. all right well listen man it's been an absolute pleasure yes thank you joe absolutely man and, and uh we'll we'll definitely uh have to do it again at some point keep me posted Right on, man. Until then, thanks. Take care and have a great record store day. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. Take care. You too.